Hello and welcome to our recap of round 10 of the candidates where this round played just before the rest day and well we'll see how the the standings change with this round. So first up we have this game between Prague against Fidit where they just play a standard anti-Berlin with Bishop takes c6 and yeah queen e2 is not the most common move here compared to castling or knight d2 and, and bringing knight r round as such to pressure the e5 pawn. But of course, it's such a strategic position with a very clearly defined pawn structure. There's going to be a lot of reasonable moves here. And yeah, in a game with bishop e3, white is preparing to be able to take on e3 with the queen and, and keep his structure a bit more flexible than after f e3. So black keeps attention with queen e7. Uh, you know, keeping the, the bishop pair would also be possible, but queen e7 was played in the game. Knight c3, now black played bishop d6, and yeah, the players just kind of maneuvering their pieces to the right squares. You know, knight goes to e6 to make it hard if white getting a good pawn break, and you know, black is just going for a, a very reliable dark squared strategy here. White plays knight takes d6, and I mean, it's an interesting question whether you take with the pawn and, you know, let white play d4 and have that extra space in the center. Or whether you play queen d6 as Vidit did, which you know, it does succeed in stopping d4, which has you know a lot going for it. White played knight e2, and you know, the arising position is one where I think it's probably a little bit easier to play white when you've got the more flexible structure. But black is just very solid, where his dark squared bishop, his light squared bishop, very well complements the pawns on the dark squares. And for the rest of the game, the game never really steered too far from balance, where. You know, both sides cast on opposite flanks, but it's just very hard for either side to kind of get a, an attack going for, for various reasons. So game went king b8, rook e1, rook f8, queen f5, offering a trade of queens. Black played queen to d6. Um, of course, queen h7, rook h8 is only opening the floodgates to your own king here as white with the skewer. So white just played queen to h3, h6. And there's just no real weaknesses you can kind of get out here. And, you know, training queens is maybe a little bit, you know, not most necessary. But it doesn't overly affect the flow of the game. Like, there's just not a lot that either side can really do to, to make progress here. And eventually, you know, the players, you know, figured out a way after after some moves just to re reshuffle and repeat moves. Where, you know, they just did a free fold repetition and, and made a draw in that way. So, you know, not too much to see with this game. Both sides just played it well. Um, if you're enjoying this video and this series of the candidates recaps, do make sure to leave a like and also to consider subscribing. On that note, we'll go ahead to the next game between the Pomlishi and Gukesh. Of course, going into round these were the two leaders of the tournament. So it's kind of a very important game for the standings in that respect. And here Gukesh played a little bit of a surprise in the move knight g to e7. And this is known as the, the delayed Cosio. You know, the immediate Kozo is the immediate knight g7. But with throwing in move a6, bishop a4, it does give black some, some options in the position. Like, for example, you know, knight c3 is considered quite good when the move a6 hasn't been thrown in. But in this case, it's less effective, you could say, where after d4 takes, it's just... You know, having this thrown in means you can sort of break the pin with b5 in, in some different positions, which wouldn't be so feasible otherwise in, in this line. Um, also, the sort of main line here is to go for c3 and you know, try to get some play in the center. But it turns out that black does get some play where you, know, you can go b5 at different moments to kick the bishop back and you know, get some reasonable counterplay. You know, white's probably slightly better, but it's it's still a position one can play. But in the game, white played the move d4, and after e takes d4, you know, white does manage to grab a space advantage in the center. But black is also reasonably solid with uh, not so many weaknesses. In fact, there's a uh, Australian IM Alex Wall who used to play this sort of thing quite a bit, but with the uh, but yeah, with the moves a6 push f4 not thrown in. Um, my plays queen e3. Um, you know, maybe queen d3 is is a better try for an edge, but I still think that you know, black can have pretty decent piece play here in general. In the game, white played queen e3. We had the move of bishop to e7 here. Um, I guess the move Queen 3 might have taken Black a little bit out of book because the computer kind of likes the idea of playing Bishop D6 and you know, sort of 
you know, going after the, the bishop on a4 in some later lines, but of course bishop e7 is going to be perfectly fine as well here. And with the move knight d5, why just trying to, you know, avoid something like b5 and knight a5, where black is able to go after the bishop, as it were, because uh, bishop d5 does run into c6. And yeah, I mean, with the bishop pair advantage, black's not going to be really worse here. So knight d5 is trying to kind of change your move order and add a little bit more pressure against this, which, you know, that's all what happened in the game. But yeah, like in this version, you know, the computer is saying to play bishop d2 and just enter this kind of opposite colored bishop position with, with this sort of thing. But here as well, it feels like the pressure on e4 should give black a more or less fine position. Um, that's not as easy to leverage like the opposite colored bishop's initiative as you, as you might expect. Well, I played a move queen g3 in the game, hitting the, the pawn on c7, maybe try to some bishop h6 at some point. Now, black could ignore this for something like d6 and, and be perfectly fine. But in the game, black played a move bishop d6, which also seems to work quite well. Um, so it's bishop b7, he has the other move that might be the most reliable equalizer. But yeah, game saw bishop d6, bishop f4, and... You know, even though white has a little bit of extra space for the pawn, it's it's not that easy to make something super tangible of it when there's, you know, already a lot of minor pieces getting traded at some point. So at h3, h6, you know, rook d3 is a, is a nice attempt to try to swing the rook into the attack. Uh, and the move c5 is kind of a, an interesting one here, just trying to exploit the as it's to sort of prepare c4, where the best option for white, funnily enough, might actually be to you know, ignore it and just play c3 and, you know, say that c4, rook, g3, you get this sort of big attack. But there's immediately a little bit of a computerish variation, which basically the idea is you kind of end up just playing like bishop c2 and just like sacrificing a whole piece, but going e5 and going bishop g6. But it doesn't really overly change the assessment. Like black's still going to be okay here with, uh, with decent play. Um, like something like this would be sort of a a typical kind of sequence where you know, white gets two pawns for the piece and a pretty strong attack, but you know black is is still going to survive in a sense. Uh, anyway, there's a bit of a digression, but to say that yeah, maybe knight b3 first and just trading off all the pieces might have been a you know a slightly more reliable way to to equalize here as black, where you know e5 isn't really something you're you're concerned about here. But in the game we had rook g3, and after a couple of moves, the pieces did all get hoovered off. Well, the minor pieces anyway, and yeah, from this point, there's just not a lot white can really play for. You know, white has a bit more space, but it doesn't really mean much when you only have the major piece on the board, and you know, black does control the only open file also, so I like to move b4 by white just to try and weaken the black structure a little bit. Um, but yeah, black's got a, enough counterplay, e5, queen d4. Queen a7 is a nice defensive move, just not giving white time to go f4 and, and use the pin. Rook d3, rook e2, and, and yeah, it, it just sort of peters out to equality, b4, rook c2. Like, both sides' weaknesses are kind of evening each other out in a sense. Like King h7, rook e8, and yeah, the players were, were happy just to liquidate and, you know, end the game as soon as possible. So rook c4, take, take. Rook b6, rook b1, and... Yeah, I mean, these pawns are, are inevitably going to get swapped off one way or the other. So, rook d1, take, take. And now that the players had reached move 40, they just re agreed to draw in this, this dead drawn position. So, well played game by both players. Like, no major opportunities kind of given or, or overlooked in this case. However, our next two games are definitely going to be a lot more exciting. And we're going to start with a game between Caruana against Ferrugia, which actually featured some, some kind of interesting ideas. So it is true that Kawana kind of outplayed Ferrugia for the most part in this game, despite missing a couple of opportunities. Uh, so we have the Knight off and Kawana played this short cut of Rook G1, just kind of in the English attack style, just preparing G4, G5 very quickly. And against this, Black decided to play the move of H5, basically, you know, saying that White's not going to get in G4. But it's also less likely that Black's in a castle short, so definitely a, a creator approach very much in in Ferocious style. Um, you know, the main lines here normally are just to play like bishop g5 and sort of use that square that's been given, or to play h3 and kind of insist on playing g4, g5 anyway. But it does mean that they get an open h file for the rook, like in a position like this, we can, you know, we can kind of see that, yeah, g4 is not really going to be so effective in this case. So 
anyhow, White comes up with a new idea of bishop to c4. Like, it's, yeah, not every day you have a novelty on move 7 of the knight off, but it is kind of a logical move in a way to, you know, develop the bishop and, you know, make the point that e5 is not going to be so enticing anymore. Um, I mean, a normal move would just be to play e6 and, you know, play it like a normal Sozin where you know, it's kind of hard to say who has the worst side of it. But maybe it's black who has slightly the worst side is just because, you know, white can still, like, castle long and, you know, make the point of h5 doesn't really flip, fit with the the position for black when, you know, he's almost certainly going to castle king side it, you know, at some point in the game or, you know, just keep the king in the center. But that, you know, has its, has its own problems as well in a, in a sense. But yeah, in the game, Ferrucia decided to play it in a dragon style with the move of g6. And yeah, I mean, I guess you could argue h5 has some use in a dragon type of position because you're avoiding bishop h6 ideas before you castle. Even so, it does feel like white's probably a little bit better. Like if knight c6, you can, you know, take, take castles and think about getting in an e5 push and, and use your initiative in the center and, and lead in development in that way. Because white doesn't really want to castle short and allow the attack, but... Otherwise, yeah, it's not so easy for Black to get all those pieces in the game without castling. There's a dilemma one often faces, yeah, in, in openings like the Night Off, uh, if you don't play it in the best way. Black went for the move Queen A5 in the game. After castles Knight C6, you know, you could play the move Knight C6 as the as a computer advisor. It's, it's something I found actually when I was writing my Dismantling the Sicilian update in 2018 that Actually, you know, a lot of positions are open scene where the modern engines do like to just take on C6 and just kind of push ahead in the center. Because previously it was thought that you couldn't really do this, like in the pre-computer era, that black would just get too much play down the B file. But, yeah, you know, with modern engines, we can kind of make it work. Like, for example, E5, and you can still see these tactics kind of being the fulcrum of, you know, why this, why this sort of works white in a sense to just take on C6 and use your development. That being said, the move that I want to play knight b3 is not, you know, an outright mistake either. But it did allow black to kind of go for this exchanging combination, whereby, you know, trading the queens, it relieves some of the pressure. Um, you know, something like take takes might leave the rook misplaced for the moment. But it's not going to be so hard, you know, to bring the rook back in the game and, and have a reasonable position. Uh, so I'd play to move h4, which actually is a lot more tricky than it might initially seem. Black should probably just keep it simple here and just take and, you know, go f4 and take castles or even bishop g4 and bring the king to g7. And yeah, I mean, black doesn't really have any any problems here from what I can see. Um, yeah, the knight's a little bit awkward on h7, but we are going to free it with f6 in the next moves and, you know, that will, that will solve that issue. But black played a move bishop e6 instead, which actually gives white a little bit of an opportunity that both the players missed in the game and... Yeah, if this was like a private lesson, this is definitely one I'd, I'd make as a puzzle for my students to, to think about. But in the game, yeah, Caruana didn't find the best move. He sort of played this quiet move of bishop e2 that doesn't really sort of do a lot other than just avoid the exchange. But it turns out that actually you do want to be exchanging, but for a kind of tactical reason where the move e5 ends up being very, very strong here. And basically... You know, if black plays knight takes e5, the problem is f4, uh, not f3, but f4. And not only is the queen frame to move out of the pin, but you'll notice after take, take the two of the the black knights are threatened at once, meaning that black will lose a piece and, and white will have a winning position. And d takes e5 is not that much better, because now you, black just gets stuck with these Irish pawns where your know, white's already getting a pawn back and it's just going to have a, a much better position. Um, I suppose knight d8 does defend both pawns for the moment, but after rook e1 you are going to pick up e5 and you're just going to have a, a very big advantage with your, your better pawn structure. Um, so that was a bit of a missed opportunity for Caruana in, in this game. Uh, and after bishop e2, yeah, he sort of was faced with the task of kind of outplaying Perugia all over again. Once more, I don't see any particular advantage to, you know, delaying just takes and, you know, knight d7 and just playing this position. Again, you have ideas like to... Activate your knight to kind of resolve any awkwardness with the pieces, but and again, king f8 was played. Um, you, know, you can sort of feel from this game that Ferrucia was probably not not so comfortable in this end game position. And I mean, yeah, it is true. Like the knight on g4, you can kind of just play around it. You know, it's not really threatening to jump in so much here. 
uh, like we'll just kick it away in response. So rook f1 was played. Um, you know, king d2, you know, does also make sense, just not allowing knight to ever really get back into the game. But okay, rook f1 was played. Uh, like I said, yeah, knight e3 and, you know, bring the rook, the knight back in, yeah, might have been a, a better idea in this position in taking like knight c4 of king d2. But in the game, we had bishop d7. Um, slightly weird retreat to my mind. King d2, bishop c6. Knight d5, yeah, just kind of keeping that bishop a bit shut in. Um, I like black snake's move f5. It's a nice way to unbalance the structure and try to get some play. Um, like if white takes, the idea is that black's going to try to go e6 and, and get some play in this way. Um, now this is a top line of the engine. Like I have some ideas to go bishop d3 and you know, argue the pawns can, can also be a weakness. It would definitely lead to a kind of accelerating of the of the pace from here. Yeah, that much is clear, but in the game, white played gf6 on passant, take c4, um, because if white does take, note that you know, you're not actually, you're not really winning a pawn as white, because if you play like rook df6 and, you know, the rook will get kicked away and the rook will then come in and take the pawn of interest, so... You don't want to play too forcingly here. C4 is, is just fine. Uh, King E7 was, G7 was played. Um, maybe King F7 is a little bit more precise, just so white can't take the pawn. Because after King G7, white did play Knight takes E7. And it's one thing I've noticed actually is that, you know, Ferugia, Tawana seems to have better results against Ferugia than almost any of the other top players. And it may be just because he's just a very, very good calculator. He's just very good at neutralizing all of Ferugia's tricks. Uh, but yeah, in this position, I mean, White could exchange the, the piece if he wants to, but in the rising position, it's only a little bit better for White. Um, you know, Rook D6 might appear to win a pawn, but Black does have Rook F8, and you know, they are going to get some some pretty decent counterplay on the king side here to more or less maintain the balance, as it were. So for this reason, White tries to keep more peace on the board with Rook E1, which is a decision that kind of proves justified based on the game. Um, you know, takes, takes, we are going to, to get that bishop back in a sense. So black plays a tricky move, knight f5 to force the exchanges that way. Take, take, and your rook d6 is still a question, but in this case, black can play like h4 and so I have enough pressure against the g2 pawn and enough active piece play to basically be okay here. So white goes bishop d3 and flicks in this intermezzo first. Rook cf8, rook d6. And if you're wondering, by the way, why Black can't just take g2, there is the, the rook g1 pin to win the piece back. But after rook f6, yeah, just c5. And h4 was kind of, yeah, the, the sort of turning point in the game where things started to get very difficult for Black. What Black had to do was play take, take, and rook d8. But we can already feel like the position's still a little bit tricky for Black. For example, rook e7, you know, rook e5, and, you know, we've still got got some pressure, you know, we're still asking, asking Black some questions, and yeah, from the human point of view, like, playing Bishop D7, it, it feels like White should have something with the extra pawn, but it turns out that in the cold light of day that Black will just go Bishop E6 and, you know, take back the pawn and, and basically just equalize in, in this instance. Um, so that was the path for Ferusha to hold the draw here, but in the game we went H4 and, you know, allowing Rook E7 was, was not so great, let's say. Rook e5, and yeah, we see the big difference here that, you know, this pawn is under a lot more pressure, and, you know, the idea of playing this, and and bishop b7 doesn't really work anymore, like, this idea is is now just a bit too slow, when I can go rook e7, and, you know, switch the pressure along the, the 7 franc, as it were. So, in the game, black played rook h5, which actually does give white a few ways to win, like, even just playing rook d8, and just setting up a skewer would be very, very unpleasant, well, it'd basically just be winning for white. White played a more passive bishop f1, which, you know, did give black a possible chance to, you know, have some chance to save the game at least. Although even here, I guess, not too late to go bishop d3 and kind of revert back to ideas we were looking at a little bit earlier. But after rook e6, king f7, bishop c4, um, yeah, apparently black has to find the move king g7 and just sort of neutralize the, you know, the discoveries a little bit. Um, and I mean, white's better, but black does have decent chances still to save the game. Like, if he plays perfectly, he'll probably survive, even though for the moment he is just a pawn down. But, you know, at least he's going reasonably well blockaded for the moment. 
uh, such a black and kind of sit on the position as it were and ask white how he's going to break through. In the game, rook d8 was played. King e1 is a very, very nice move. Just make sure rook d6 isn't going to come with check later, ensuring that I can't take the pawn because of the, the rook e2 discovery. And once you get your king to f2, like you just have full control here with you know just everything being very well protected. I uh, had a5, a5, b a3, b5, bishop d3. So again, the weakness of the f5 pawn being fixed in place comes into play. Bishop d5, rook e7, and you know, even king f6, bishop b5 is, is going to be winning for white as well. Uh, like for example, uh, a bishop ending like this one is just very clearly a win for white when this pawn's fixed on a light square and you've got outside pass pawn to boot. After bishop f7 in the game, yeah, white just took. Um, you know, rook d6 does run into bishop c4 using the pin. So king f6, rook c7, and yeah, once again, once you get into the pure bishop endgame, it's it's just going to be an easy win, where you know, black will not be able to cover both of these pawns and also stop the b-pawn running forward. So this is why Ferusha resigned in this position, which leads us with one game, and you know, you'll sort of see from the result of this game, this was a very good day for the Americans. You know, both the US players won their, their games today. I mean, they both got back up to, to plus one. However, the result doesn't tell the full story because this one definitely could have gone the other way as well, as we'll see. So, so far, the player's been following, you know, the Nepo Abasov game from round eight, which had Castle C4, and we you know, looked at this in the round eight recap. So Nakamura decides let's keep a bit more tension, a bit more play in the position, and, you know, played the move C3. Um, you know, quite a logical move playing the style of Alapin Sicilian, where you're able to keep that bishop on this long diagonal. You had bishop d6, castles, castles, and it's it's not much for white here, but you can try to at least work with the g5 e5 square and make the point where there's less pressure on the center than usual. Um, like it's actually kind of reminiscent of a of another line the Philidor. Like if you take these sorts of positions, like here black is, you know, very happy to see a move like c5 because of, you know, the fact that the center is not under any more pressure and black just builds up a you know, a really strong attack in, in these lines. So kind of interesting to see the parallel in, you know, in this situation. I mean, black could still be fine here, but you guys have to be a little bit careful. And already I feel that this position was one of the key ones for the game, because in the game, Abasov played the move b5 and just went for this kind of pawn storm on the queen side. But the problem is that white's play on the center and king side is just a lot faster and a lot more pertinent. So for this reason, black should probably either play the move rookie eight, just making it harder for white to you know, get the knight into e5. Or you can even play very directly, just g5 and, you know, just take and, and go after the, the pawn like knight h5. It's, it's a very direct approach to position, but it's one that does seem justified and it's not so convenient for white to, to defend the pawn. Like king h2 might seem obvious, then queen d6 and suddenly, you know, you don't really want to play queen e1 and, you know, face this monster attack, but... Uh, actually, it's a very beautiful variation of white does play queen e1, where black can play even like bishop h3 and, you know, sack the, sack the bishop, but just have a, you know, a monster attack like knight g3, and of course Nakamura would never actually fall for this, but it's kind of a, a nice showing of like how, how black's attack can play out here if white is, if white makes just a couple of careless moves, but anyway, it'd be a very, very different game in this case, and not sure if Abasov was concerned about like a knight g5 sack and this is why he rejected it, but you know, you can break the pin, so it's not the not the end of the world by any means. Uh, but yeah, the game saw b5 and you know, Nakamura played it pretty well, just put the knight on e5 and just have this very nice piece play on the on the king's side, where this pin is also a little bit of a fawn in black's side. Uh, black played a move bishop to c7, and with his last couple of moves, he's just cleared the way to deal with the pin so bishop f6 won't double the pawns as it were. Why well, play the move b3, trying to open up a second front, create some additional weaknesses potentially. With a move a4 is a good reply here, just trying to keep some sort of control and you know, maybe also you'll go after the c3 pawn in some positions. Where knight f1, um, yeah, I mean this position rook b1 maybe strikes a little bit more natural, but okay, they're both kind of thematic moves in the position you could say. After knight f1, black played the move a3. Um, as I said before, maybe bishop a5 is, is maybe the go here. 
um, and trying to get the knight in a e4 one way or the other, but the game saw a3, rook a b1, and you know, for the moment, white has a pretty good control over the position. Um, you know, knight g4 is also okay. Like, the computer likes going knight e3 and just, like, not caring about, about bishop e5 whatsoever. Sort of making the point that if you can ignore the threat, then you may as well do so. But, yeah, knight g4, of course, not a mistake either. Your white still has a pretty pleasant advantage. Queen e8. Um, I like the move bishop g3 here. You, know, you could also make an argument for... Just piling the pressure on the d5 pawn. Uh, because it's not the most convenient one for, for black to defend. But bishop g3, also a good move. Just trade off their good bishop and leave them with the bad bishop. Black tried to avoid this exchange with bishop a5. Still though, we can see that white has some very pleasant pressure. And it's kind of tough for black to defend against the... Well, what's basically sort of a space disadvantage for black in a way. Because the a3 pawn is a bit overextended and the rook is out of play. Black played the move knight c8, trying to avoid the move bishop d6. Um, which, even though computer says mistake, it does kind of force white to, to play precisely here. Yeah. Where if he doesn't find the right move, then he, he is actually going to lose his advantage. And in the game, actually, Nakamura kind of found the right idea, but not the best way to go about it. So he played the move bishop f4, which you know, clearly is preparing to move g5, try and open up the g file. But when you're playing chess, the question I, I sort of like to ask my students as well sometimes is, well, if you're playing move A to prepare move B, you can kind of ask the question, well, can I just play move B directly? And it turns out you can. You can actually just play G5 out preparation. Because if they take, you just go queen H5 and, you know, you just have a fork to regain it with interest. And likewise, they flick in queen C6 and then play HG5. You know, same story, you go here and you you threaten mate and a pawn. And I mean, this is just a completely dominating position where black is not in time to take the c3 pawn. Because we go bishop e5 and you know, if they try to defend with something like queen d7, for example, we can just bring our knight in and black's just not really in a position to defend everything at once, where he's going to end up a bit overwhelmed, tactically speaking, by the flood of all our pieces coming into the attack. So a very instructive sequence, I guess it's true that, you know, at this point the players were getting a little short on time, like not significant time trouble, but they're just starting to approach it a bit. And yeah, over the next moves, Abbasov actually manages to not only, you know, equalize with some offering of exchanges, uh, but I mean, to be fair, White maybe should play takes in G5, even if it's, you know, not winning the, the way that it was before. That at least, you know, allows you to try to get your knight in and try to exert some pressure on the dark squares. But White kept the piece on the board of rook b1, and, you know, queen d7 is just a very nice move to hit the, hit the, uh, pawn. Um, you know, knight e3 looks natural, but then the, the pawn on c3 is, is an issue. Uh, White probably should go knight h2, but in the game you end up playing g5. Okay, queen, bishop g4, and, yeah, now black is, is actually starting to be better here. Where, you know, now it's White who kind of has the, the fixed weaknesses in his pawn structure. So yeah, at this stage, it's it's kind of looking a little bit difficult for uh, for Nakamura. Um, you know, move rook b8 is probably best, but then you're kind of admitting that the best you can get is a, is a draw in a position like this. And, you know, I guess my feeling, not sure if that's necessarily true, but my feeling is that maybe Nakamura was want to keep, like, any chance at all to win the game against uh, the lower rate player in the field, even if it means taking some risk. Because, like, in this game, like, if you don't win it, you're more or less giving up your chance to ever win the candidates in, in 2024, as it were. So after rook b8, king h7, queen to c1, I mean, in a way, like, Nakamura's choice to keep the much maximum tension did pay off here, because this is where Abbasov made a blunder that allowed White to kind of turn the game in his favor. Um, the move queen e7, yeah, it defends the pawn and, you know, would be very strong except for the fact that Nakamura has a very, very strong reply here which I'm guessing that we just missed in the game, that Abbasov missed in the game. Uh, what Black should do here is probably just play to move Bishop to C7. Um, if you want to play Bishop D8, that's actually not too bad either, just with the idea of taking back the, the pawn in a sense. But yeah, Bishop C7 is kind of the key move after take, take. It might initially appear that White is, is just going to win the, the pawn on A3, but now the move Queen E7 comes in clutch where white can't actually take on a3 now because of the move rook c2 and you're know, winning the piece like this 
and otherwise, well, Black's just going to invade with the Rook and have a really great position, whereas a big difference here compared to having the Bishop on h2 on the board. Because in the game after Queen e7, White had the defense of Bishop to e5, which is not just a defense in terms of, you know, stopping the deadly Rook e1, but it actually really turns the tables on Black, because now his Rook is actually kind of trapped, where if we sort of give White an extra move, then yeah, we can see how you know, knight g3 already threatens to, you know, win the exchange as such. So black played the move queen e6, uh, yeah, in hindsight, maybe it's best to play, well, the computer is saying the sacrifice piece with bishop c3, but that, you know, kind of admits how bad things got already in a way. After queen e6, white played knight g3, um, you know, I think a move like knight e3 is just probably only for the computers, let's say. Um, but knight g3, you know, does win material. Still, like, from a human point of view, the position is actually very complicated still. Like, Black's going to be getting a second pawn for the exchange, and I mean, who knows what's going to happen from there. Um, turns out, technically speaking, move Rook A8 is, is meant to be really good in this position. Um, but yeah, from a human point of view, it's pretty scary to allow the, the bishop in as such. So I, I think I like Nakamura's move better from a human point of view. Just Rook B5. And now a very nice move of Queen E3 just kind of stabilize the position a bit with a Queen trade. We had take, take, d4, take, take, king, f1, and, you know, white still does have, like, a rook that's kind of more, has more, let's say, harmony than the bishop does. The fact black's knight has pinned the kings out of the game it does tip the scales in white's favor, where, you know, even a move like bishop b2 is not necessary enough to, to save the game. I mean, from a computer point of view, probably it is, but from a human point of view, I think white, white would still win this most of the time. Just, you know, bring the, the knight into the, the attack, as it were. Uh, but the game saw h4, 92, and, you know, from here, Nakamura didn't really give give a bus of another chance. Uh, rook a3, take, rook a8, and... I mean, the a-point is going to be too strong. You know, black has to try to create some sort of counterplay. So he played the move f5, but, you know, knight d4 just you know, keeps the pieces centralized. a3, take, take, king f2, and we kind of see that the... The checks do peter out here after king to g2. Uh, game went f4. Bishop f5, just, yeah, exchanging off the, the bishops, or, you know, if they do refuse the exchange of these bishops and you know, move the bishop away, then, yeah, you have, like, bishop e6, and you can even just win the, the knight, for example. Uh, the game ended f3, king f1, take, take. Bishop g5, a5, and, you know, we'll easily catch the black pawn, but black can't really stop the a pawn effectively. This is the reason why Abasov resigned in this position. Um, so yeah, fun little recap. You know, we can see here that the standings are now still Gukesh and the Pomnashi in the outright lead. But where you have, you know, the chasing pack of not just Prague, but also Nakamura and Karawana in that chasing pack as well. So at this point, you know, since we have just four rounds remaining in the tournament, I feel like it's, it's kind of a good moment to, you know, share like who basically Gukesh and Nepo will be playing in the last rounds because that way it'll give out of like who's more likely to win. Now, unfortunately with the standings being shown, so looking at the next four rounds or after rest day tomorrow, it seems from, like it's not confirmed in the standings, but it seems that basically Nepo I think has the better tie breaks than Gukesh because I see him listed first on all of the standings. So it means that if there was a tie for first, uh, I actually don't know what like the tiebreak rules are, like whether they play a tiebreak match or whether it's just like the person with best tiebreak qualifies for the world championship match. And I realize it could just be a hypothetical thing because I do think there's a non-zero chance that Ding doesn't defend the world, uh, his world championship title and therefore his chance could well very be to decide who is you know going to play a match like between you know first and second for the world championship title, much like we saw in 2022. Um, but yeah, looking at their pairings, I think Gukesh does have the somewhat easier matches overall, where he's going to be playing, you know, in the next four rounds, not in this order, of course, but with the white piece against Caruana and Ferrucha. And he's also going to be playing with black against Abasov and against Nakamura. Um, I think those like pretty good pairings for him. I mean, you know, against Ferrucha, like Ferrucha is probably going to like push even with the black piece against him. So it's a Decent chance to win there, relatively speaking. And, you know, being black against Abasov, again, also some some chances there. Um, and, I mean, Karawana and Nakamura also, like, some of these games, 
they might be like quite close to must win games. So again, kind of a you know decent situation for Gukesh to kind of build up his score and rack up, you know, a couple of wins potentially. And also I think that Gukesh has kind of been in better form overall than Nepo in this tournament. Like Nepo, yeah, has made you like not lose a game and you know, but he only play not to lose a game in the tournament. However, the kind of flip side of that is he also has had a lot of games where he's been like worse, like where in a way, like, you sort of had some good luck to get to his score of, you know, 6 out of 10. Whereas Gukesh Ring has maybe been slightly unlucky not to have more points, given that, you know, he was much better against Nepomnishi in their first game. He was also, you know, better against Ferusha before going to lose the game. So in a sense, there was only a bit of potential for his score to be better, whereas you feel that Nepo's score could very easily have been quite a bit worse in a, a different universe. Um, and then when you look at, like, Nepo's of opposition, like, he's going to be playing... In the next round, again, not in order, but he'll be playing with White against Pragnananda and Nakamura. And then he's also going to have Black against Vidit and against Caruana. So it's sort of fairly similar to Gukesh pairings, except that, you know, the fact that Gukesh starts to play Abbasov and Ferusha, while Nepo has already played them both, I do believe that does tip the scales kind of in, in Gukesh's favor. And maybe it's just because I like the variety, but I do feel like, narratively speaking, that Gukesh winning candidates is probably the, the most satisfying conclusion, I would say. Um, but yeah, we'll see how it how it turns out. Like at this stage, I think Gukesh is slight favorite over Nepo, but you know, with four rounds to go, like anything can happen and it'll definitely be a lot of fun to to watch it play out. Um do and comment below as well, like, you know, what we kind of one of two things, like Ivy go, what's your your favorite sort of move or round from move or game from this round? Or, you know, who do you think is going to win the candidates? Do you think it's going to be Gukesh? Or do you think it's going to be Nepo? Or do you think it's going to be someone else entirely? Uh, let me know in the comments below. And uh, yeah, I will see you for the next one. Take care.